Here on slide 40, we have a table of which of these containers allow push and pop back, push and pop front, which allow subscripting with square brackets, which allow you to clear the contents of the container using the dot clear member, and also which ones allow you to examine the front or back element using dot back and dot front. Most of these operations are restricted to the sequence containers and whether they permit push or pop back and push or pop front has to do with what is efficient for these sequence containers. And by efficient, what we mean is that it's an order one that is a constant time operation. So we know that push back is efficient for vectors, decks, and lists, but not for forward lists. And it shouldn't be any big surprise that pop back, which takes the backmost element from the container, is also efficient for vector, deck, and list. Push front, on the other hand, is inefficient for vector, but it's efficient for deck, list, and forward list. Forward list is only efficiently modifiable at the front, whereas vector is only efficiently modifiable at the back. All right, and so pot front also is not provided for vector, but is provided for deck, list, and forward list. Now the back member function returns a reference to the element at the back of the container. And that's supported for the vector, deck, and list, but not for the forward list. If we wanted to get a reference to the back element of a forward list, we would have to write our own algorithm to traverse through all of the elements from the first element all the way to the last element and then give a reference to that back element. Front, on the other hand, which also gives us a reference to an element, works for all of the sequence containers, vector deck list and forward list. Now, as far as random access of elements using some kind of subscript, you can use square brackets for vector and deck, as we've talked about, but you cannot use square brackets for list or forward list. It turns out you can also use the square bracket notation for maps and unordered maps. The subscript is the key, and what you get by indexing using the key is the value associated with that key. Now, it's important to understand that the square bracket subscripting is not checked at runtime in the case of a vector or a deck. Checking at runtime takes a little bit of extra time, and C++ is severely allergic to taking a little bit of extra time, if that can possibly be avoided. So the square bracket is not runtime checked, and if you use an index that's outside of the range of subscripts for a vector or a deck, then what's going to happen is undefined. That could be any kind of behavior from giving you back some kind of random value to crashing your program. If you want to do careful checking that the subscript that you're using is within the bounds of your vector or deck, then there's a dot at member function that you give an index to, that is an integer subscript in the case of a vector or a deck, and that is checked at runtime. And in fact, if the index that you use is bogus, that is it's outside of the range of values for a vector or deck, this will throw an exception which will crash your program. We will get into the details of exceptions and how you handle exceptions in lecture 16. Subscripting for maps, it turns out, is different from subscripting in vectors and decks. You can use subscripting in a map and also in an unordered map. The index that you specify if you use either the square brackets or the at member function, is the key. And if a pair with that key is found, what you'll get back is a reference to just the value part of the key value pair. 
Now, unlike vector and dec, where you get undefined behavior if you use an index that does not exist in the square bracket notation, in a map or unordered map, if you specify a key that does not exist within the container, what happens is it creates a new entry with the index that you specified as the key and the default value. Now that default value will be zero for any of the built-in types, care, int, unsigned, long, double, and so forth. Or it will be whatever you get from the default constructor if the value is some kind of class type. For example, if the value is a string class object, then you will get an empty string as opposed to a string containing a zero or something like that. As with vector and dec, if you use the at member function and you specify an index that does not match one of the existing keys in the container, this will throw an exception and crash your program. Notice that indexing or subscripting is not available for multimaps or for unordered multimaps. This is simply because the keys in a multimap or an unordered multimap are not unique, and therefore if you attempt to look up a particular pair using a key, it's not guaranteed that there will be either 0 or 1 value. Finally, clear is simply used to eliminate all of the elements of a container and all dozen of the standard template library containers support clear. Here on slide 43 we have some examples with the output shown on slide 44. V7 on slide 43 is a vector of care initialized with six cares. M2 is a map from a care for the key to an int for the value. And M2 is empty currently. If I say v7.front, what I get back is a reference to the first element in v7. And I can use that reference and assign a value to that referred to care. So what's going to happen here is that the little h will be replaced with little j. Following that, in this for loop, notice that I'm stepping through each of the elements in v7, one element at a time, and I'm using the ith element of v7 as my index into the map m2. Recall that going out of bounds on your indices in a vector would crash your program, but using a non-existent key as an index into a map will create a key value pair with the default for the value. So the first time through the loop, i is 0, v7 sub i is the little j that is now the first element in v7, and so when I say m2 sub little j, since M2 is empty, that's going to create a pair in M2 with a key of little j and a value of the default for int. So the value will be 0. Now, what I'm going to get back from M2 sub j is a reference to that value component of the pair. And so into that value component of the pair, which is initially 0, I'm assigning some new value, specifically i times 2. Now here i's value is 0, 0 times 2 is 0, so I am assigning a 0 in place of the 0 that was already the value part of this pair.